My name is Alman Zalecki, and I'm Director of Academic Affairs here at the New School, as well as coordinator of our new food studies program. On behalf of Dean Linda Dunn, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the food studies program's panel discussion on Julia Child, Culinary Revolutionary. Before I introduce, introduce tonight's moderator, who will in turn introduce our guest speakers, I want to tell you a little bit about the food studies program. As some of you may know, the New School has offered a few courses in culinary history for many years. But beginning with the spring 2008 semester, we began offering a full complement of courses in food history, culture, writing, business, and policy. Our aim with this new curriculum was to join the growing conversation on food production, distribution, quality, and taste. A conversation that, judging by your presence tonight, you've been following and participating in as well. We have recruited the mix of scholars, practitioners, writers, and that the New School is well known for to teach our courses. And so far, the response has been tremendous, both from the faculty and the students. In the spring, food writer, culinary historian, and tonight's moderator, Andrew Smith, taught a course on contemporary food controversies that brought experts with a range of views on issues in food production and consumption to the New School for some very lively conversation and debate. This summer, Andy begins his series on, on uh, seminal figures in culinary history with Julia Child, Culinary Revolutionary, both a short course and tonight's panel discussion. And he follows in the fall with MFK Fisher, Poet of the Appetites, in the same short course panel combination. In the fall, we also offer short courses on Italian food culture and food writing, and full semester courses on food science, policy, business, and literature. I won't list all of our fall courses now, but I do encourage you to sign up to receive our fall catalog due out at the end of the month to see what we're up to. We also welcome your comments and suggestions as we continue to develop our offerings in food studies and culinary history. Please note that tonight's event is being recorded for webcast. So this is just a reminder to either turn your cell phones off or turn them onto their quiet mode. That includes you, Andy. And when we get to the question and answer period, please step up to the microphone over there to ask your question. And now, on to our discussion. The moderator of tonight's panel is culinary historian, food writer, and member of the New School's Food Studies program, Andrew Smith. Andy is a, I'm not done. Andy is a prolific writer and frequent contributor to academic journals and popular magazines. He is the author of 16 books, including Peanuts, The Illustrious History of the Goober Pea. You, th you thought I forgot that one? The Tomato in America, The Turkey, A Social History, and the forthcoming Hamburger, A Global History. He's also the, the author of the Encyclopedia of Junk Food and Fast Food and the Editor-in-Chief of the Oxford Companion to American Food and Drink. Andy has taught food studies courses at the New School for 13 years. One of his courses, An Introduction to Culinary History, from Marcus Apicius to Julia Child, is taught in chronological order, beginning with Roman cuisine and theoretically ending with Julia. The course is loaded with content, and Andy confesses that he doesn't always make it to Julia Child by the end of the course. Tonight, he makes up for this omission with this panel of distinguished guests. Please join me in welcoming Andy and our panelists. I was very nervous uh, when I was informed that we were going to be in here. Uh, the last time that I had um, a presentation in this room uh, was a year and a half ago, and uh, I was uh, scheduled for 10 o'clock in the morning, and at 10 o'clock in the morning I showed up, and there was only one person, and, and he was sitting there right by the um, elevator. And I figured, well, I didn't have the right time, I didn't have the right day, something was wrong, I didn't know what was on. Uh, so I went back to him and said, listen, I don't know what happened here. Something didn't work. And he very slowly said, well, you know, um, I'm an organic dairy farmer, and I have 300 cows on my farm. And every morning at 6 a.m., I go out to feed my cows. And if only one cow shows up, I feed her. <laughs> I got the message. <laughs> I walked back to the podium and for the next three hours discussed the importance <laughs> of Aristotelian thought on Marcus Apicius's manuscript uh, on cookery. Uh, at the end of my presentation, I went back to talk with him and I said, well, you know, um, how, did, how did I do? 
And uh, he very slowly said, well, you know what I told you was true? I am an organic farmer. I do go out to feed my cows at 6 a.m. in the morning, and if only one cow shows up, I feed her. But I don't give her the whole load. <laughs> we are not going to give you the whole load on Julia Child tonight. Uh, we have intentionally given to you the biographies of the speakers, and I'm only going to mention the high point, which in each of their cases is a book that they've recently uh, published, and hopefully uh, books that we will all have time and energy for signing uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, Judith Jones is senior editor and vice president at Alfred A. Knopf. Her latest book, which is wonderful, how, how many of you have had a chance to read it yet? Several of you have. How many of you have already bought it? How many of you are going to be buying it? Judith, your presentation better be good, all right? We've got to sell those books over there. The Tenth Muse, My Life and Food, uh, as Judith will tell you, uh, she was the one at Alfred Knopf who uh, found Julia Child, or found the manuscript, um, and uh, the rest will be uh, history, and Judith will tell us that now. Judith. Okay, thank you. Well, I first met Julia Child on paper this huge manuscript, over 800 pages easily, arrived on my desk. When I was at Knopf, I was a young editor. I'd been there just a few years, mostly doing French translations. Didn't have anything to do with cookbooks. But everybody knew that I'd spent three and a half years in France and that I loved to cook. And so when this manuscript came our way, I was a natural to look at it. I learned later that Houghton Mifflin had been sort of toying with it for years, had even put down an advance, and uh, Julia and her two French partners tried very hard to give Houghton Mifflin what they wanted. But finally, after, I think this was the second time round, and the, the men of the company called her in and said, Mrs. Child, Nobody in America wants to know this much about French cooking. <laughs> well, it so happened that I did. And, you know, an editor follows her instincts. And I, I, was, I was taken with it for several reasons, but primarily because I had lived in France. I loved French cooking. I tried things. I took to the butcher, the baker, the vegetable man to get recipes. But I knew that had a long way to go to really cook well, and that's what the French had. And I wanted to understand the techniques, the ingredients, how, why. And I started to read this book, and it was like a gift from heaven. There it was. I mean, the bourguignon recipe went on for, I don't know, probably 10 pages, but it told you <laughs> what kind of meat to buy, why it was important to dry the meat, and that when you brown it, you mustn't do too many pieces at once. You mustn't use all butter, or the butter will burn, etc. And if you just, once these rules were imprinted in your mind, you were enabled to cook. And that was exactly Julia's mission. When she uh, was finished with the Cordon Bleu, she got together with these two French women, and they had a mission to teach Americans to elevate us, to really make us able to cook good food and not the awful fast and easy that was prevalent at the time. And she realized, it wasn't the French women, it was Julia, that you had to translate every step of the way. That little formulas, put three pounds of stewing beef in a pot and a cup of water and two cups of wine and boil for three hours. <laughs> so that's a delicious dish. Anyway, she knew that, that she had to awaken Americans by teaching them. And it, she was the one that wrote all the detail, the whys and the wherefores. And she was the perfect person because she didn't learn to cook till she was over 30. She went to France. She had her first filet of sole meunier, and it was an epiphany. And uh, she had that that same realization, really, that I had, that you had to know how and why, and then she went to cooking school. But she was, because she'd had to learn late in life, didn't just learn at grandma's knee, she had that analytical mind that could deconstruct and put it all together and make 
us good cooks. Now, for almost a year, we corresponded over this book because she and her husband, Paul, were in Stockholm. He was posted there as, as a, he worked for the government. And uh, <clears throat> so when we finally met each other, it was almost a year later, and it was, all the letters had still been Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Child. We disagreed about things, and she shook her finger at me sometimes when I went too far about peasant food. And, uh, but we had, we had really become friends through this remarkable manuscript. And the first time she walked into my office with Paul, I, you, you were overcome by her presence. And uh, I realized what, the, 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 what she had. For one thing, they had a team. She and Paul worked very, very closely together, and he was always the one encouraging her. But she had that wonderful mind to just go after anything, the whys and wherefores. And, and for instance, when we started working on this book, I innocently said, uh, you know, you don't have a cassoulet. And I think that's one of the great French dishes. Whoop! Cassoulet! And then, she, <laughs> and then correspondence started with Simone Beck, known as Simpka. And there was a folder this big on Cassoulet with Simpka. <laughs> writing to Judy saying, no, 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 you have to have, uh, you have to have goose, you can't have. And Judy was saying, well, you're not going to find goose in America in the supermarkets. And, so on, but we finally got a cassoulet. And then when I innocently said, you know, you can't get a good garlic sausage even in New York. I mean, it was a wasteland then. And she said, well, we'll make a garlic sausage. <laughs> and the next time I went up to Cambridge in their <laughs> kitchen in Massachusetts, one whole wall was covered in notes. Julia had gone back to old charcuterie books of the 18th century and tried the different formulas and her notes. And finally, you got to the end where Julia had worked out her own sausage for the cassoulet. And I said, Julia. And she said, well, it's not hard. It's easy as making a hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> so she had that quality, too, that it was fun, that the whole idea that the poor little woman was so burdened that she had to buy fast and easy and it was demeaning to cook was just something that she was determined to turn around. And certainly this book got off to a, an extraordinary start. I don't think anybody believed that it would do what it did before Christmas, which was went back to print. It was almost 20,000 copies sold. But the real miracle was almost a year later when she got on this uh, talk show in Boston, WGBH. It was a it was a, an intellectual show, but Judy was invited to come on. And so she brought her Bunsen burner and uh, <laughs> her, her omelet pan and eggs. And she started showing America, well, this little Boston audience, how to make an omelet, flipping it and turning it, coming out just perfect. And they got such mail, they said, bring that woman back on. <laughs> Pretty soon, they got the idea and put together 13 shows, and little by little, they were taken up by stations that, all over America. And I think what she really did for Americans, we were so repressed. We'd bought this message from the food industry that the little woman shouldn't be cooking. And certainly, I grew up in a household, English, that all. Oh, we never had garlic or onions only for little lambs do. And so, and you never talked about food at the table to say num num the way Julia would say. It was, it was vulgar, it was like talking about sex at the table. And uh, suddenly Julia sort of lifted that Puritan repression and people said, hey, it is fun. And she did it so naturally and spontaneously. For instance, I remember once when she was, had patted the chicken breast and was rubbing the butter in, somebody said, why do you massage the chicken? She said, well, I guess he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that just endeared her to all of America. And I, I, I think that was part of her great secret.
our second panelist is Dr. Joan Reardon, who has flown in today just to be with us uh, from Chicago. Uh, Joan uh, was the author of MFK Fisher, Julia Child, and Alice Water, celebrating the pleasures of the table in 1994. Uh, she has then went off the Julia Child uh, tangent and went into um, MFK Fisher, and her latest book, um, MFK Fisher, Among the Pots and Pans, came out a week ago. We, and we have copies just for you here tonight, all right? We've made it special for you. Uh, Joan. Thank you. Um, well, Judith met Julia through a course through letters, the correspondence. I met Julia when um, we ha foolishly had a second home on Cape Cod. So going from Lake Forest, Illinois to Cape Cod was always a bit of a challenge. But um, uh, Boston, largely because of Julia, was such a culinary center. And it was a, just a very heady, marvelous place to be. Uh, in the in the um, late 70s and in the 80s, and so um, I, I remember uh, attending a meeting of the New England um, Culinary Guild, and um, and meeting Julia. And before that, when I had been working on an oyster cookbook uh, at the Schlesinger, I would would um, pull out different books on shellfish and oysters and so forth, and I would see Julia's little marginal notes. This won't work, <laughs> <laughs> or that will work, or it seems too much salt here, and so forth. And I was, I was just delighted to be handling the, the review books that had been sent to Julia and, uh, and reading her comments. So, um, uh, Though I enjoyed writing about food because of the academic background, I kept getting pushed into sort of research projects. And the Julia Child papers were at the Schlesinger, as were the MFK Fisher papers. And so uh, at one of the meetings of the New England Culinary Guild, I uh, approached Julia and I said, has anyone written anything about you, uh, a book? let's say. And she said, oh dear, no, <laughs> nobody has. And having uh, taught women poets, because obviously the male poets are always going to be studied, but you know, what about the women poets? I felt the same sort of thing happening uh, in the culinary world. I mean, James Beard would always be written about, Craig Claiborne would always be written about, but where, you know, were the books about Julia. So uh, Julia did give me uh, permission to uh, read her papers at the Schlesinger and, uh, and also to photocopy them and so forth. And I would say that in terms of research on Julia Child, uh, the, uh, the letters that Julia has written the extended correspondence, particularly the correspondence with Simca, really formed the basis of much uh, of the, the book that I wrote. <clears throat> uh, also, her letters, um, her correspondence uh, with MFK Fisher, again, very insightful. And though at the time the Avis DeVoto papers were not open, <clears throat> they since have been. And those three, there are obviously other correspondence, as with Judith and so forth, but those three are so extensive that um, they're very revealing. And though I can remember Noel Riley Fitch mentioning that um, in interviews, I had, I had shared some of the tapes that I had uh, made of Julia's uh, you know, conversations with me, uh, with Noel Riley Fitch, and she said, you know, Julia seems to say the same thing in all of these interviews, but the letters are very different and a very rich source. But I'm sort of not on the track that I should be on. <laughs> when, 
when I <clears throat> decided to do uh, the, the book on the three women, uh, there were very uh, there were similarities, but there were also vast differences. Each person, uh, M. F. K. Fisher, Julia, and Alice Waters, had changed to a great extent the culinary uh, landscape of America, but they did it in very different ways. But there were also, and I was going to write about their friendship with each other, their relationships with each other, was going to be a series of essays. And um, somehow in the writing process, uh, it, it became very clear to me that there was a California and a France connection. They all experienced epiphanies going to France. Uh, MFK Fisher at an earlier time so that her vision of France was considerably different. Uh, Alice later than Julia, so her vision was a bit different, but all three of them fell in love with France. Now, why fall in love with France? Well, uh, the New York World's Fair in 1939 had the famous French pavilion. And that is, is the origin of many of the famous French restaurants in New York. So French food, French cuisine, always had a certain cachet uh, attached to it. The groundwork was being laid. In 1941, when the world was at war, literally, uh, Gourmet came into being. And Gourmet Magazine was extraordinarily important in laying the groundwork for this fascination with things French. And it's amazing. Uh, there's a book that I would highly recommend. It's called, um, Uh, the, um, where is it? Thank you. Yeah, The Remembrance of Things Paris. <laughs> You've been reading it in class? No. The Remembrance of Things Paris. And it's amazing that in, in a magazine like Gourmet, you would get an article, for instance, on French couturier. You would get an article on French cinema. You would get an article on Les Halles. You would get an article on uh, Cassoulet. Uh, it was such a vast span of articles, and they all, uh, you know, fed into America's fascination with um, things French. And it's ironic because France surrendered so very early in the Second World War. So there was a certain political and a certain social disdain for the French, for the collaborative government they had. But that did not diminish that fascination with food. And so in this country, we have um, magazine articles over and over again promoting French food but they are doing it, that is, before Julia Child, by shortcuts. And I thought you would be amused to hear some of these things. Um, there was an article in the Ladies' Home Journal in 1954, and it was about French, French cooking, and it recommended using Tabasco and onion soup gratinée and also using frozen and canned peas and canned artichokes. And this is the kicker. In 1954, there was a Vogue article titled, A French Chef in Your Kitchen. The author recommended a wide array of American brand name processed foods, including frozen oysters, Sardi's Jiffy White Sauce, Robertson's Plain Chicken Broth, canned shrimp, canned peas, pie crust mix, 
cream of mushroom soup, ketchup, craft French dressing, frozen strawberries, <laughs> and, and jello instant vanilla pudding. <laughs> Finished with instant coffee. <laughs> In all, the author proscribes using only 13 fresh foods and an equal number of processed foods for her menu of oyster souffle, consomme soubrette, filet of beef with the mushroom sauce, tossed salad, French bread, cheese, and strawberries a la liqueur. By serving these recipes, uh, and this is from this um, particular article, uh, she claimed that one's guests would believe that there is a true French chef in your kitchen. <laughs> So, so we were, I mean, there were all of these magazine articles uh, and presumably some cookbooks as well were advocating French food, but they were also, uh, you know, using shortcuts to do it. And Alice B. Toklas published a cookbook in 1953, I believe it was, and she said, I'm so happy that we have a food processor now because I can put fresh tomatoes in the food processor and have a fresh puree rather than a canned. So uh, you have uh, this dichotomy of wanting to be French and have French uh, recipes, but uh, not really um, doing uh, the authentic French cooking. And this is where Julia Child comes in. I mean, when she wrote her cookbook, even though these recipes are fairly lengthy, and, and, but they're very thorough, and I have friends even today who will bring to a potluck supper or whatever one of Julia's chocolate cakes, and they'll say, it takes forever. There's so many things you have to do, but it's always delicious. Uh, Joan, there were several people that wanted those recipes. Can we hand them out? <laughs> Our third speaker is Laura Shapiro, the author of three books, Perfection Salad, Something from the Oven, and her most latest book that came out just last year is, is the textbook that we're using in our class, Julia Child, A Biography. Laura? The, um, the thing that I want to talk about is uh, how Julia's... Uh, Julia's Frenchness was at heart completely American. And this is what came out to me when I opened Mastering the Art of French Cooking to do the research for my book. And when I went into the archives to read the correspondence that, uh, that Joan has been talking about, uh, you see this American in there. You see an American woman loud and clear. When Julia went to France, she, like many other food-loving Americans at the time, this is after World War II, had a total conversion experience. She gets there, she eats this food, she thinks, where have I been all my life? This is the most wonderful thing that has ever happened to me. And a lot of people felt exactly that way. MFK Fisher, it happened to her. Alice Waters, it happened to her. And it happened to many tourists. This was the start of the age of tourism to France, and it was happening to them. And uh, typically, you have this conversion experience, and immediately you start living life in a hierarchy where French food is up here, and this awful American stuff that you're trying to leave behind, these jello salads and these canned soup sauces are, are down below, and they're back there, and you sit in the cafe, and you think about baguettes, and you make fun of Wonder Bread, and you are a changed person. It didn't happen to Julia that way. Her conversion experience was completely different. Uh, George Balanchine used to say, there's no uh, such thing as ballet or modern dance. There's only good dance and bad dance. For Julia, there was only good food and bad food. French or American, it wasn't important. Ultimately, it was good or bad. So uh, my favorite example of this is something that happened to her while she's still in Europe in 1959. They are uh, posted to Oslo, and she was invited to the 
meeting of the American Embassy Wives Club, and it was a it was a luncheon. And this is a this is quite written about her response to this luncheon. She wrote to Simka. She said, "This was the worst meal I have ever had." <laughs> and she describes it in fabulous detail. She said, "We get there. There is this tower of frozen." whipped cream studded with these frozen rock hard pieces of fruit. She said, and it's on this lettuce leaf. She said, the lettuce leaf is so small you can't even hide the thing under it. <laughs> she said, next course and last course is this gigantic piece of banana nut cake made from a mix with this thick tan frosting. So this is, this was disgusting. So it's the 50s, it's a women's event, and it's classic 50s disgusting food. This is like an emblem to all of us. This, we recognize this, this is bad. To Julia, it was not an emblem. It was just terrible. It was not definitive. Later that year, she herself is the hostess for a meeting of the American Embassy Wives Club, and 24 of them come over to her house, and she, she writes to uh, Avis DeVoto, actually says, she said, I asked, two gals to help me, and one of them made a big California-type salad, and the other one made two beautiful chocolate rolls, and I made a boeuf bourguignon, and Paul made these rum cocktails. She said it was the best meeting, everyone had a great time, and we all, uh, we all said what a success this was. So there you have it, it's, uh, it's the same 50s, it's the same women. It's wonderful American and French food made by three American home cooks. That's, that's what it was for Julia. You didn't, French food was not this impossibly high thing that nobody could get to. You could get there. You just did the work. And sometimes American cooking got you to that same high plane. So that was really what, uh, that was kind of the heart of her experience and what she, what she brought back. And while she was working on mastering the art of French cooking, which we've heard is a, was a, a, a process of research and experimentation that went on for, for nine years. She, uh, she was all the time reading the American food magazine. She read Gourmet, she also read Woman's Day, which she much preferred. And she, she, read, uh, she, she read everything she could to get a sense of what the people back in America were cooking and eating. And she sometimes wondered, are they, going to, are they going to like this stuff? Are they going to put in the time and do the effort that it takes to make this? She thought that one taste of this food would do it and that they, you know, then it would open up and, and, they, and they, they too would be converted. She said in these cakes, you know, they're, they're going to turn away from these baking powder cakes and, and try this, these French cakes uh, risen only with, with eggs. And, it, you know, once they taste that, they're going to be changed. Didn't quite happen that way, but it, you know, it, uh, people got another, another step or two. But this image of the Americans using only packaged foods was something that uh, she fought. She, it's not so much that she fought the use of the packaged foods. She was totally open to the packages if they were any good. She sat there in Paris trying frozen chickens and instant mashed potatoes and Uncle Ben's uh, converted rice. She tried all these things in case something was good. And if it was good, she would incorporate it. Not much of it was good. She had a big fight with Simka over packaged pie crust mixed. Julia actually thought it was OK. Simka thought it was poison. She, and they went back and forth on that. Finally, it did not get in the book. Simka said, come on, you know, I'd say it's not French and it tastes horrible. Julia said, well, it's true it's not French and it does taste kind of horrible. But you know, it's a pie crust. They'll do it. But it didn't. <laughs> she didn't go that far. But she was open to it because it would get people into the kitchen and cooking. So she had a kind of resilience in the world of French and the world of American that was just, it was going to see her through. She was not dogmatic about any of it. And when, she, uh, when the book came out and then she went on television, that, of course, is what you saw. You saw this incredible open-mindedness and resilience. And that was really her magic. Our third panelist is Molly O'Neill, who for 10 years was the food editor for the New York Times Sunday Magazine. 
uh, her memoir, which uh, came out two years ago, Mostly True, a, a memoir of family, food, and baseball. I have several questions about baseball I'd like to ask you a little later on, if that's okay. Uh, I am absolutely delighted with you know, the book that you recently edited, which is American Food Writing. Uh, in my opinion, it's one of the best books that has come out on uh, food uh, history um, in the recent last several years. So, excluding Thanks, the ones of our panelists here, the other the other books our panelists put out are actually wonderful as well. Uh, but it's a fantastic thing. Unfortunately, she doesn't make any money on the sale of the book, but uh, it's a great book anyway. Molly. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. <laughs> um, I met Julia in a slightly different way, and so my story is, is a little bit different. Um, hopefully, it'll, it'll bring us into today or close to today. Are people hearing OK? Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, you know, Judith met Julia through a manuscript and letters between Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Child for a year. Uh, Joan met Julia in the margins of books at the Schlesinger, and, and Laura met Julia in the archives. Um, and I met Julia at Savinor's Market in Cambridge. Um, by the time that it was about, I, it was, I believe, March of 1979. Um, and I had already been to the master course at La Varenne, and I had been running an Italian restaurant in the Back Bay. And there weren't very many women in Boston who were cooking, and so I was frequently written about. And um, I was in Savinor's Market because that's where you went. That's where you could get good food. And I lived right around the corner. And um, I one day heard the voice. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was over at the counter. And um, I was somewhere else, but I heard the voice. And um, Jack Savinor, who was still alive at that point, said that he really wanted us to meet each other. And he called me over and he said to Julia, you know, this is, this is Molly. And, and she said, oh, of course, dear. <laughs> and, um, and, and he said, you know, Molly, Molly is a, a chef. And, uh, and she said, no, oh, isn't that an Italian restaurant? <laughs> um, and what she didn't say is, aren't you a woman? <laughs> because... I, I was, you know, not completely within the valence of what Julia at that point in her life considered to be a chef. I don't know why, but I just could not get over being this close to the voice. And, and I just burst out laughing. And so did she. I realized very, very soon, you know, I was, I had, I was doing my chefing, but I was also very busily writing the great American novel. And I would sit in my room and type very, very early in the morning. And actually, I would gaze out the window. And I was gazing at Julia's house. Um, I realized this as we walked home from Savinor's with our bags. And um, very soon after that, and I can't remember why this happened, um, I would write for a few hours in the morning, generally one or two words, and then they were very well chosen words. And um, then I would um, go over to Julia's, and she would be cooking in this kitchen, and I, I had a, you know, I had gone to La Varenne, and I quite frankly felt that I was a superior cook. And um, I was certainly much neater in the kitchen. <laughs> and, um, and I took it a lot more seriously. And, and I felt that it should be taken a lot more seriously. <laughs> Just like my writing. <laughs> and Julia understood these things about me immediately. And she was very compassionate. <laughs> And gradually, as my you know, two or three words a day would add up to paragraphs, I would take them with me. Um, and I would, 
basically act like Julia's assistant. You know, I'd clean things, I'd put, she had this pegboard with everything outlined on it. And so I would, you know, put the measuring spoons where they belong and put the, which is my kind of task. And she, um, and we would talk. And what I didn't realize is that Julia was trying to get me to kind of lighten up a little bit. And um, I thought she was just, being superficial and that she didn't understand how serious this all was. And um, she did understand that very well and she kept asking me to bring things that I'd written over. And I remember the first essay I wrote um, was actually, I don't know why, but it was going to get published in the Boston Globe. And I brought it to her because I was terrified. I'd never written for a newspaper. I was, I'd started as a poet and I was very serious, and um, I brought the story over, and she read it, and she marked it all up, and she said, um, I think you've nailed it, dear. Now you just have to find the fun. <laughs> and, and that was when I finally heard what she was saying. And, um, and in, the, in the remaining two years in which I saw her, you know, a few times a week, uh, I did find myself becoming lighter and um, funnier and really not buying in to my generation's extreme seriousness and preciousness about food. Um, and so when I think about Julia, I, um, and, and you know, what is her lasting, what's her legacy? Um, first of all, it's as Laura was talking about, um, she's a democrat. She was a democratic person, and and that that was her message. It, it didn't matter. She she was not going to put a filter on her view of the world and say, I am this. I am I am a non canned soup person, and the rest of the world is canned soup, and therefore they do not matter, and I do. That was just not something she was going to do. Now, it was not, it gave her a certain kind of blinders. I'll tell you another story, and it was when all of the stuff happened around veal. You're probably all too young to remember this. But there was this, there was this big thing about veal, and PETA was going crazy, and there were these terrible stories about veal. And Julia insisted that, um, that there was absolutely nothing wrong with the veal industry, and that she and I would sail forth one day and we would go and inspect a veal farm, which we did. And um, it was horrendous. <laughs> I, I, I've never, well, I have seen worse things, but I worked on a rescue squad and that's the only reason I've, I had seen worse things. And Julia thought it was great. And Julia would absolutely not bow to the fundamentalism of the animal rights movement because she didn't want to live in a world that was controlled by people getting power over other people and limiting a world view. She had wonderful politics, social politics. She was a lifelong Democrat and very proud of it and very liberal and she had some of the worst food politics I've ever been in a kitchen <laughs> with. The most wonderful thing about her is that she never stopped getting better. She never stopped looking, you know, really shining a bright light on her own blind spots. And I, I learned a great life lesson from that. I think her other two, am I going over? It's fine. It's okay. No hook. It's okay. okay. Um, I take timing very seriously. <laughs> the, um, the other two things that I really took away from Julia and I thank her for, um, the first was generosity. Um, I, I was raised by generous people and am by nature generous. But in my early years in the food revolution, I forgot how to be generous. And I am so grateful that I remembered how to be generous before I embarrassed myself in print. <laughs> I had so many other ways of doing that. Um, 
And it was a way of being. It wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't something that was articulated. It was, it was the sense that you err on the side of kindness, you err on the side of generosity, and you never stop giving. And I, the amount of energy that she spent with me was unbelievable, especially since I was cooking in an Italian restaurant. Um, the other, other thing that I, I think is her legacy and is the reason she endures and will endure is that Julia was about joy. And joy does not go out of style. It's like classic French cuisine. We may not do it, but on high holidays we go to church. And joy is the same thing no matter how miserable and bleak and sardonic and ironic and everything else the world becomes, we are suckers for happy endings. We are suckers for blue skies. And Julia was all about that, not in a sentimental way, not in a stupid way, but she made a decision to live from joy. And her cooking was an act of generosity and an act of joy. And um, if, you know, if I hadn't had that time with her and if she had not been incredibly generous with me, my entire career would have been books like the one you just saw. I wouldn't, you know, they'd all be like encyclopedias and I'd be broke, you know? <laughs> so I'm very grateful to Julia for that. Um, and there was one other thing that I'm grateful to her for, but, um, I'm, I'm kind of forgetting it. I was going to tell you a, a story about her, um, but I, I'm forgetting which story I was going to tell. I, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about driving with Julia. She had a rabbit. It was, it was very, do you remember rabbits? It was very well known in Cambridge because it frequent, frequently went up on the sidewalks and made these bizarre turns, and the policeman just looked the other way. <laughs> As you can imagine, I take driving very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a very nervous passenger. Um, and, and to add to Julia's, you know, the last chapter in the generosity is one day I was, you know, cooking in this Italian restaurant, which was a huge Italian restaurant, and I had, you know, all of these, it, this was before, the last thing that I think Julia really gave us was that she almost single-handedly took food from, and restaurant work from a blue-collar occupation to a white-collar occupation. There's good and bad parts to that, and I'd love to have that conversation with you. However, it changed the world that we live in. And one day, uh, just shortly before I stopped cooking professionally, I was in this kitchen and I was, you know, I had a staff of, I think, 45, and most of them had done hard time and the rest were illegal immigrants. <laughs> and um, suddenly, all of the waiters came flapping in because who is in the dining room at Julia and Jacques Pepin? And what was parked on the sidewalk in front of the restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> but the rabbit. <laughs> it was her gift. Um, she made sure that her visit was written about, that my name was mentioned, and um, that she thought that it was highly, she was quoted as saying she thought it was highly likely that there could be an Italian chef one day soon. <laughs> Thank you. We will open it up for questions, and if anyone does have a question, if you could just simply come over here to be on the microphone. In the interim period of time, Molly started off by giving an, an incident uh, with uh, Julia, and did the others of you have an incident that, that you remember more than any other? Well, uh, when I was doing the research <clears throat> for my book, uh, the Schlesinger was open Monday through Friday. 
and then on Saturdays I went to Julia's house on Irving Street and she was extraordinarily generous. She would say, you know, here's the office, go through the papers, whatever you need, dear, fine. And uh, gradually uh, she would uh, uh, invite me, you know, to have a cup of tea or so with her. Uh, and this one day she seemed to be quite agitated, which was unusual for Julia. And this, this is a side of her that I, I didn't know, and maybe a side of her that other people don't know. But uh, she had been reading the, the paper, the New York paper, and at, I don't recall the date, and I don't really recall the particulars, but it was a case, a very famous case in New York of child abuse, yeah. uh, an adopted uh, child. Uh, it's a Yes, it was a Steinberg case. Right. She couldn't let go of that one. No. And she was really very upset. And she just kept saying, I don't know why people have children when they're not going to cherish them. And I thought that was so, uh, it was another side of Julia that I would never have suspected. Uh, and, and that's. Um, I think, uh, you know, along with her joy and along with her humor and fun, uh, she had really very deep convictions. And it's too easy, I think, to, to look at her as just a sort of icon or, um, uh, you know, really great personality. But to see behind that, uh, and uh, it was one of the few times that she ever revealed herself. Yeah. Laura? Just on the subject of uh, her convictions, uh, she, she was, as Molly said, a, a great Democrat and a strong political liberal, if not a food political liberal. And the letters are full of her raging uh, letters to this senator or that representative on gun control and birth control and all these things. And she had a great exchange with Senator Jesse Helms. <laughs> <laughs> At the time that uh, there was the Robert Maplethorpe exhibit at the Cincinnati Art Museum, and uh, they were trying to shut it down for obscenity. So Julia had gotten this garden catalog in the mail that, that had a, a picture of, a, of like a garden ornament you could get, which is a little stone statuette of a little girl holding up her dress like that. She sends this to Jesse. <laughs> She said, you're so upset about obscenity in that museum. Look at what's coming into people's houses <laughs> every day. And Senator Helms right back, dear Miss Child, <laughs> you know, this is so unbecoming of you to send this to me. And, you know, what, you know, what's going on in that museum is so much worse. She wrote back and said, I've been to the exhibit. She said, you know, my husband is a photographer, so I was very interested in this. And I went to the exhibit, and I liked it very much. She said, I'm just sorry that I never got to see those pictures you're making such a fuss about, because, thanks to the publicity, there was such a crowd in that room. <laughs> <laughs> I could never get near it. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, you, so you, get, you get a range of her personality in there. So. <laughs> Judith, anything? Well, I remember. Uh, one of the things that you always had such fun with, Julia, and I remember once we went to Provence for Christmas, and we were staying in a little nearby inn, and I went over Christmas morning to ask her if I couldn't help with the preparation. She said, well, you can help me get the tendons out of this <laughs> goose. And she said, you know, those pesky tendons, they're so tough that if you don't get them out, you'll just won't be able to eat the leg. So she said, here's how you do it. And then she slit the, the end and put her finger in and pulled, and then she flung the goose on the floor and got a broomstick to brace herself and pulled and pulled. And pulled. Finally it came out and she said, just as easy as pulling, pulling a cork out of the bottle. <laughs> Molly, another one? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, after I moved to New York, um, Julian, <laughs> Julian knew that I was an early riser, as was she. And um, most mornings, I didn't mind when the phone rang at 6. <laughs> but I was single and cute then. And I, sat, Sunday mornings were something different. But without fail, as soon as I started to write the Sunday magazine column at the New York Times, every Sunday morning, the phone would ring. And that, this was back in the days of answering machines. And I would listen as the answering machine came on. And Julia would say things like, is that Molly? <laughs> Dear, I, I've just read your column. Where, where is the meat and the butter? Those vegetarians haven't gotten to you, have they? Molly mentioned legacy, and I guess that's one of the questions I have. Um, Julia's been uh, deceased now for four years. Um, her books are still in print, uh, but are the recipes used? And if so, what is her what is her real legacy that she has left for us? Anybody? I do think that, that the recipes are used, and we continue to sell the Julia Child books. But, and I think that she really changed the way we look at what a cookbook should be. I'm, I'm sorry that today's crop doesn't always bear this out, <laughs> but uh, the cookbook language should be explicit and visceral and really tell you what you mean and explain the whys and wherefores instead of in a bowl combine the first mixture with the second mixture. You read a Julia Child recipe and, you know, you're doing it. You're doing it with her. She's right there. And uh, I think that's a very important thing that she loved us. She really did believe that French cooking was, for the Western appetite, the only codified cooking. And everything else, like Italian, right. was. Right. <laughs> and, and she s would stick by the rules. I, I was working with her when she and Jacques Pepin did this book together. And she'd say, Jacques. You can't just put endive into that pot without blanching it to get the bitterness out. And you know, Jacques was saying, Salor, you know, so <laughs> muttering to himself. But, but so, so she did have those very strict rules that she lived by, but she was open to new things if, as they came along, if they were good. Judith, what was her, so far, what is her top selling, but what sells the most steadily? in terms of her book? Well, I would say that over the years, probably Mastering the Art has sold the most, the cumulative. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but Julia Child, oh, you know, the big one that she did. The first time she used The Way to Cook. The Way to Cook? Yeah. Has also been, yeah. that, that continues. They all do, really. Laura? I think uh, we don't, even for company, we don't do a lot of that kind of uh, Mastering the Art of French cooking, cooking anymore. To me, what the the legacy uh, the legacy is the success. When that book was ultimately a runaway success, it just proved something that publishers had not been willing to believe before, which is that American women would tackle long recipes, that people would make. Uh, dishes that they couldn't, you, nobody thought they could pronounce, that there was a market out there for real food. And up until then, you could not have gotten a publisher to believe that. But Julia's success threw it in their face. And after that, they had to publish a few of those books uh, once in a while. They couldn't say what Houghton Mifflin had, to, had said to Julia when she first presented this unwieldy manuscript. Nobody's going to touch that. They, uh, after that, they had to take it seriously. So I feel as though just her success proved something. And in some ways, that's, we all, we all are living with that now. She legitimized uh, cookbook writing as, mm -hmm. as a new cookbook publishing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, stand up, stand up, stand up. Sorry. Um, I think that um, 
Julia legitimized cookbook uh, writing. Judith legitimized it as a publishing niche, more than a niche. Um, and also, it seems to me, and Judith will correct me, that the money Knopf made on Julia allowed you to publish a lot of other very high quality cookbooks mm -hmm. and kind of opened up the field. Um, but well, that it, that it worked, certainly. That's right. Alfred yes. Knopf, who was yes. a, a real food and wine connoisseur, but he never went near the kitchen. Yeah. I mean, that was a but different then, era. When they saw how successful it was, how let me much run money with it. it generated, they yeah. said, okay, you know, you can do some more. Uh -huh. um, yeah. I had dinner many times at Julia's house on Irving Street, and always somebody else cooked. And Jacques Pepin once said to her, Julia, do you ever cook? <laughs> Not anymore, dear. <laughs> I, I do want you to know that Jacques Pepin wanted to be here tonight. Uh, he is in Aspen with the Food, food and Wine Conference. So, um, oh, but he did say he would, he would come back at some point to the new school and do, uh, would love to be a party of anything related to Julia. Gia, question? I think maybe the biggest change that Julia Child made was what is we find in the grocery stores. We find more fresh produce. We find different kinds of meat. We really do find things you can cook with. And all of those processed foods have been shoved into the middle. So it's very efficient shopping now. You just go around the edges, and you can get whatever you need. But now we are facing something that Julia would have been very interested in dealing with. And that is the incredible inflation that's taken place over just the past couple of months. The price of flour, the price of milk, the price of everything. What do you think her reaction would have been? I think that Julia would have been very happy um, about this. She would be very happy that America was finally getting its farm goods off of welfare and that we were, are beginning to pay market value. She would be deeply unhappy about the reasons for this. Um, and I, I think she would also be quite outspoken about things that are not being discussed in the food world today, namely that we are, we're not facing a water shortage, we have a water shortage. We are not facing an oil shortage. We have it. And it is completely disrupting our growing practices. It is completely disrupting our distribution practices. And we're in a big mess. And I think that Julia, at, you know, toward the end of her life, would have been talking about this in political terms and not mincing words. Um, I find myself really wishing that, that she were around because I don't know many people who, who can talk about this. Newspapers don't want to hear about it. Books that are grim and stuff don't sell. Um, and it's hard to, and, and you know, if you're on TV, you have to be cute and peppy. You can't be talking about the end of the world. Okay, Laura? During the uh, 70s, there was a, a hike in meat prices, and there was an effort at a meat boycott. And somebody wrote to Julia and said, you know, would you join the meat boycott and join us with this? The idea of boycotting meat. <laughs> this did not strike Julia well. So she wrote a very interesting letter back. She said, are you kidding? And then she said, the way to deal with these prices is to treat meat the way every other country in the world does it. You cook everything, head, feet, tail, ears, right. snout. You, you, know, you use all the weird bits. Don't eat like Americans, eat like the Chinese. And that's how you deal with it. So I think uh, in answer to your question, I think that, is, uh, that would have been her response to the current prices today is just learn to use meat the way they do everywhere else. Joan, comments? Uh, no, just uh, you mentioned before Julia's influence in terms of ingredients available in supermarkets, but there is another facet to that too, and that is the um, various cooking utensils that we have here, very, very much influenced by Julia. 
mean, they used to say that uh, if she did a, um, uh, a program on Charlotte's, that the Charlotte molds would be cleaned off Fine the shelves up. the next day. So um, that, you know, that is another, another uh, byproduct, you might say, of her, of her television shows. Not to pay for it. Right, exactly. Judith, any comments on how would, how would Julie yeah. respond today? Yeah, I, I, th I think it's th th pretty well covered. Yeah. Okay, another question? Well, as like everyone else in the room, I was a major fan of Julia's and I had the pleasure of meeting her just briefly a few times. Um, but recently I was reading and know that the new movie Julia and Julia is be was recently being filmed here in New York. Now, do you think that Julia Child would approve of Meryl Streep playing her? <laughs> Laura, I, Laura. I don't oh, and think on she the gadget, would Excuse me, Judith, I'm sorry, but on the gadget question, I remember very well from an IACB conference, Julia many times saying she loved every new gadget that came along <laughs> and reveled in them, which I always adored about her. No, I think she'd really enjoy Meryl Streep. She might not enjoy Julie so much. But. <laughs> Do we have other comments? Are we going to be silent on this issue? Laura? No, I think the Meryl Streep part, yeah, I think you're right, is fine. Her... Uh, her reaction to the book, I think, would, would not be that enthusiastic. <laughs> I had uh, one other question. I've read the books. I've read a lot of the secondary material. I haven't been into the archives, which I feel badly about. I've looked at every one of the DVDs that are available from the Fresh Chef and other of her programs down there, and I'm still puzzled by how could she ever have done this. In the first place, uh, the book comes out, as, as Judith, as you note in your by three unknown women, uh, who have virtually no credentials, at least no American credentials, um, and the book starts selling. Rand, uh, Knopf did not put a lot of money into promotion, very little, and I know you did some wonderful things, and you mentioned them in the book, and those are great, but man, I've done those same things for my books, and they never sell. You know? <laughs> so my question is, before the French chef takes off, which I understand from that point on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Knopf sold at least 20,000 copies, and it was going into a third print of a huge, thick French book, cookbook, and there were at least uh, several other very popular and well-financed French cookbooks that were on the market, like the one from Gourmet, for instance. Uh, so why did this succeed in the first place? Well, I think because of her fundamental belief that you had to translate, you had to explain and enable the home cook to understand and, and really do the difference between just an ordinary meal and what Julie would call soigné. And uh, those other books weren't particularly soigné. I mean, the, the gourmet, uh, the recipes were in little blocks like that. They never explained ingredients, what a shallot was, or something like that. And <clears throat> Julie once said to me, Judas, we were born at the right time. And there's a certain truth to that, because the timing was right. People were going to France. Secretaries, for the first time, could take a, a little economy flight and be having dinner in a real bistro. And they were awakened. And then I think also her awakening, as I said before, that, that uh, sensuality in all of us, to be appreciative, to love good food. And the book was full of this. And I think it was a combination of all those things. Right. Joe? In 1961, when the book came out, the Kennedys were in the White House. Yes. It was very, very well known that Jackie was searching for um, a French chef. Um, and and er, her every move was literally followed. So um, that, that created a, a very good uh, atmosphere, you might say, or an ambiance for accepting uh, the the French chef, and also I think what what impressed me uh, when I was working in Julia's house was um, uh, was what I could only call her work ethic. I mean, for all of the you know light moments she had, she had an extraordinary work e uh, ethic. Uh, she and Paul would be entertaining somebody they knew from the uh, foreign service and so forth for lunch, and you'd hear all this sort of banging in the kitchen, 
and laughing and, you know, corks popping and all the rest of it. As soon as the door closed when that guest left, Joey would come upstairs and boot up her computer. And that was, uh, that was amazing for me to see. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the work, the work ethic is, is um, quite extraordinary there. She really worked at selling her books. I can remember her saying in letters, I'll do almost anything to sell a book. <laughs> and, and she did. I mean, the people who, who waited in line to have her sign books, I mean, and then they, they were so thrilled um, and uh, felt they knew her. Yeah, there were, there were really, uh, before the French chef came and, and provided her, a, you know, an obvious market, there were really two stages of, uh, of the success of that book. When it first came out, it reached the people who were interested in French cooking, and there were certainly 16 or 20,000 of them. They were people who subscribed to Gourmet and who had been to France, and those people went out and bought the book, and a lot of them found out about the book because Julia and Simka and Paul financed themselves this cross-country book tour where they went and they just pulled every string. They called everybody they knew in each city and they organized their own department store cooking demonstrations. And Julia, every single person she met, the food editors and the women's club presidents and all the kind of important people for sales that she met, she would keep these lists and this one has a dog named Fufu, and that one, that one loves chocolate pudding, and she's got it all on these lists, and for the rest of her career, she just housed the dog, and she's just, she was totally on top of it. But the other thing that happened was, uh, they, so she, she reached this first level of uh, French cookbook buyers kind of right away, and then things really sagged, and she was irritated and she would write to Knopf, why don't you take out an ad and so and they and they kept not. <laughs> and uh, what happened, the great turnaround was really uh, the Book of the Month Club. She got, the book got selected as an alternate. They thought, okay, we'll sell, uh, you know, another handful of books will come through that. It went through the roof. It became the most successful alternate selection that the club had ever known. So this other level of interested people had been tapped. Thousands more were out there who, who kind of didn't read the review in the New York Times, but when this thing came through the Book of the Month Club, they were going to take a chance on it. So, so those were the readers, and then when the television show came on, they were the yeah. start of the grassroots right. thing. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I think that there were, I agree with every single thing that's been said. Um, the selling thing I learned firsthand. We were, I don't, I can't remember why, but we were once in Southern California at the same time, near Pasadena, and I, I, I know, my first book had just come out, and I was doing a signing, and Julia came um, by before, long before, and, um, and we were walking through the store, and she noticed that her own books were not well displayed. <laughs> and she said, watch this. <laughs> and she revamped the display. <laughs> she put her books in the front <laughs> and the other books in the back. And then she pointed out to me that my New York cookbook was stacked up in a way that it didn't hit people when they walked in the door and she turned them all around so you saw the spine and then she propped the cover of, of the book up. And she told me that I should never waste a publisher's dollar on tour if I was not willing to work display. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing I think re that really came across in her, you know, in, in Julia's first book and throughout her career, and this is a great tribute to, to Judith, is that Julia was a real person. This was not a put on. This was not like someone acting like they were a gourmet or writing in the way they thought they should write. This was a goofball who wanted to be a spy, who is incredibly smart, 
and is deeply passionate about her subject and knew very early on that the way to deliver it was with humor and grace and heart. And she was lucky enough to get an editor who allowed her to be real. And I, I think that that is such an extraordinary. In fact, I had to encourage her because she was, there was a, a modesty about right. her too. And she felt she was writing not only for herself but for the two French women. But little by little, she eased up and would give more of herself. Before, but she wasn't uh, a me, me person at all. Right. Before Judith was properly miked, she said that she, in fact, had to encourage Juliet first because she was a naturally kind of humble person and was writing as part of a team. Oh. And it took some time for her voice to begin to emerge. But I think that that went a long, long way. Mm -hmm. She became the personification of a certain appetite. Yeah. My, my final question uh, is relatively simple. Um, two of you have mentioned that she was in the right place at the right time. If someone with Judith's qualities arrived today, how would she, how would she fare? All right, a woman oh, at 50 years old, 10 feet tall, speaking in a funny voice on television? I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> I do. She wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a size three. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think it's so hard to translate it to a different time because we've come so far. Look, at, we're more knowledgeable about food. We're more experimental than any country on earth. It's a, so that it, it's hard to see her walking onto the scene today. You, you just have to work. I think the, the message, you know, was, was already sent. Uh, between 1959 and 1969, there were about 98 cookbooks published on the, the, the subject of French cuisine. So, I, you know, she, she started something mm -hmm. very definitely, but I think we're in a different time and a different place today, mm -hmm. truly. We have two more questions, and, and then uh, if I could uh, ask the panelists, would you be willing to stay around a bit and sign uh, autograph books? Uh, sure. I just thought I'd ask just to make sure that they were willing to do that. Question? As long as they're well displayed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Question? Well, I'm, I am 39, but I'm not 10 feet tall, nor do I have that imposing voice. Um, I am a vegetarian. <laughs> so. Nothing like Julia Child, but she completely inspires me. That somebody who was a nobody can become such a, vo a voice and a person to inspire you. Um, I am an Indian, and I'm um, not so happy with the Indian cuisine out there, even in New York City. And it is my deep desire to be able to bring authenticity to a cuisine that's probably as old, if not older, than even the French cuisine. But it's so misrepresented. And I'm keen to hear from you, would it, would it be if it was a Julia Child, but not in a French revolution, would it still be a possibility of seeing another cuisine and another Julia Child? Judith? Well, I think we're very open to all kinds of tastes and ideas and new books, but it still is a smaller proportion of the cookbook buying population that's going to buy a vegetarian Indian cuisine. It, it's just sort of a fact of life. I think if you got on television and had the proper décolleté and start <laughs> slapping things around, that it wouldn't help. Ele work. Elephants won't, would have to be brought in. <laughs> Other comments? Other comments? Okay. Well, if, if I could just um, end and uh, before thanking all of our panelists and ask maybe uh, what might be a heretical question, um, but following on the last question, maybe at least Molly will be sympathetic. I'm wondering if we can see Julia Child and Mastering the Art of French Cooking as, as the beginning of the ascendancy of French cuisine that's now had its golden age 
and is now passing on to perhaps simpler cuisines that now draw on the, the freshness of the ingredients that were that, that Julia played such an important role in, in get, making available to Americans. I see even Molly shaking no. her head, so I see that's where that's going. I, I think the answer to your question is no. I think that Julia was not the beginning of an era. Julia was the tipping point. We, we have to remember there was a lot of French food in America before mm -hmm. Julia Child. There, it just wasn't in, in the homes and she brought it home to people. Um, and to say that she, I mean, yes, Julia was absolutely part of a history that has brought us today's cooking. However, so, so were hippies. Um, so were um, a lot of social upheaval that happened around that time. So is women returning to the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, and so were rising health concerns. So can we say that one thing, you know, initiated and carried these things through? The ball was shifted. Julia may have kicked the ball off, but other people picked it up and carried it and are still carrying it. I just have a hard time with any view of cuisine that is, suffers from presentism. Yeah. What's happening today has happened before, and it will happen again. It's not only a personality, it's, it's a, a lot of different socioeconomic forces, and one thing explodes, or two things explode. So, no. <laughs> Well, and I think the other thing is that uh, Julia did kick one ball. I'm not very good at these uh, sports metaphors, but another ball <laughs> came into the field from Alice Waters and the whole California mm -hmm. camp. Yeah. And that has had an effect that is so profound and so long lasting and so life changing is the sort of focus on ingredients and the whole market, uh, you know, agriculture uh, end of things, which in Julia's mind, as she said to me once, it's just people pulling a lot of things out of the ground and eating them. <laughs> this was so not her thing. They don't even cook them. <laughs> This was the, the ingredient revolution. Do you think they washed them? <laughs> the ingredient revolution was a revolution Julia wanted nothing to do with. It just was not, not how she wanted to eat. The, uh, the sort of Alice Waters perfect meal of, is this, you know, radish on a plate with, a, with, a, with an edible flower. It's, you, she did not, no interest whatsoever. So... Uh, so, for, you know, so for the century to continue and the interest in cooking to continue, that other element kicked right in. But what would Julia think of molecular cuisine? It's, it's kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Andy Smith first. I, I wanted to thank several people. The first is Alma Zalecki herself, the Director for Academic Affairs at the New School. She permits me to do all sorts of bizarre things. I would like to thank Pam Tillis, who really did all the work. Pam, can you stand up? Okay, I've got to stand up, Pam. Pam did all the nitty-gritty work behind the scenes and did a, a superb job, so thank you very much. I want to thank um, the students that are in the audience. We have some students in the audience, or former students. Can you at least raise your hand? Very few students are out there. A few of you are raising your hand. I'm noting down your names. You're in big trouble there if you're not here. All right, uh, that's not true. Uh, and there are several of you who actually knew Julia Child uh, relatively well. So can you raise, stand, you need to stand up. Can you stand up, the three of you? You don't want to stand up again, okay. And then finally, of course, our panelists. I think they did a superb job. <laughs>